to begin with a very uh, general uh, uh, statement about uh, digital trade the broader picture of course the whole event uh, uh, so uh, uh, well organized by the commonwealth secretariat and of course the caribbean telecommunications union and and my uh, uh, thanks to to both organizations and to each individual involved in this deals with different aspects of digital trade but not only trade because i've seen also issues that are, have, are more uh, of more general interest for everything that is digital uh, of course ancestral deals with the uh, commercial law so i will have to limit my comments uh, to uh, digital trade uh, but i have to say that uh, this is also easily done because nowadays all trade uh, is digital uh, even if we look at the informal sector or the uh, micro enterprises we still see uh, that uh, uh, electronic communications are used in one way or the other because they are so pervasive and ubiquitous what maybe uh, has changed a little bit compared to uh, the focus that we had maybe 20 years ago is 20 years ago we were very interested in the fact that we could exchange information uh, very rapidly and at, at a great distance and at very limited cost and now we are more interested in uh, looking at that information which we consider uh, data and reusing and analyzing data so this has of course uh, changed uh, many things in the way we look at digital trade every country wants uh, to engage uh, successfully in digital trade uh, but we know that there are a number of conditions each of them is necessary but uh, none of them uh, in itself is sufficient so first of all we have to have coherent and i would say also decisive policy decisions where policymakers need to, to, to make the right decisions, but they also need to see them through. And this is sometimes difficult when digital trade requires, for instance, coordination of uh, not only the private sector, but also the public sector, like the customs. Then we need a robust technical infrastructure, of course, connectivity, and this may be an issue, especially in developing countries. Let's remember, for instance, we do a lot of work uh, in the Pacific, where many of the Commonwealth member states uh, are located. And these countries, they, in some cases, uh, they still are connected only with the satellite, which is really expensive. And, and that limits a lot their involvement in the global uh, digital economy. We need to have uh, private sector engagement, uh, because if there is no uptake of the private sector, of course, there is no, uh, no trade, no digital trade, and no trade in general. And then we need to have uh, an, an appropriate legal environment. And here, uh, my uh, main issue is to find the balance between uh, uh, what we call the enabling legal environment, that is to say, ancestral texts, uh, which are meant to promote and facilitate, remove obstacles, and regulation and regulation uh, is uh, of course uh, uh, very important but uh, at the same time uh, it also sets uh, limits uh, to what can and cannot be done a typical example of uh, regulation is consumer protection uh, another uh, typical example is uh, data privacy it's very important and i have to say Commonwealth member states have done very, this very well uh, to base the law on international standards. And why is it important in digital trade? Because we want to promote technology neutrality uh, and through technology neutrality, technical interoperability. Technology neutrality means that the parties can choose the uh, products, technologies and methods that they wish to use to engage in, in, in trade and the technical interoperability means that if all the products are really technology neutral it is possible to exchange data uh, across applications and we get back to what i was mentioning before about the importance of data reuse and analysis 
when I talk about the use of electronic means in trade, of course, this can happen with regard, and often we talk about contract law, but sometimes we talk about dispute resolution when we have a, a specific applications, for instance, in transport law, in banking and financing, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it is a cross-cutting issue. And in itself, if we look at digital trade law, we see uh, different main components. We've, I follow here a little bit the distinction of UNCTAD that has identified four main areas. E-transactions and e-signatures, data privacy and protection, cybercrime and consumer protection. But I would like to add right away that payments and intellectual property rights are also very relevant for digital trade. Um, these four areas uh, are not the same. Uh, Data privacy and protection, cybercrime and consumer protection are regulations, and they often call for a dedicated body to enforce regulation. E-transactions uh, is actually an enabling component and does not call for any implementing agency. Ancestral deals with e-transactions, and that's why ancestral laws do not have, they have, of course, a, an administering body, uh, a, a, a minister, most likely, uh, but they don't have a dedicated agency. So e-transactions and e-signatures law, they give us uh, the foundation for the legal recognition of, of uh, the use of electronic means, and they remove the obstacles to their use. In particular, for instance, one issue that we are all familiar with is the statute of fraud, uh, which uh, requires the use of the written form for certain transactions because, uh, of course, this was a safeguard for the parties. And then we ask ourselves, uh, uh, when uh, we use electronic means, when do we satisfy this uh, written form requirement? And the answer is in this e-transactions law, uh, which apply across across the board. So we apply to emails, we apply to WhatsApp, to, to SMS, we apply to websites, to platforms, and, and any other thing you can imagine. And since we are so foundational, well, at least 80% of the states have them, but I would say even more than that, maybe 90% of the states have them. And there is this global model, uh, which is the model of Ancitral, uh, which is technology neutral, as I said before, because it promotes interoperability. It, applies as an add-on, so it does not change, for instance, contract law. And because it was prepared uh, by the United Nations, it looks really at global integration and tries to take into account all uh, legal systems and, of course, all uh, different types of economies. And then there are regional models. And as we're talking about the Caribbean, I have to say that uh, uh, most, if not all, the countries have adopted ancestral texts, but many of them have done so through a regional model, uh, which was prepared uh, through ITU HIPCAR uh, some 10 or 15 years ago. Um, of course, uh, this is uh, absolutely possible. At the same time, we also encourage to keep uniformity whenever it is it is possible to to foster not only regional digital trade but also global digital trade. So Ancitral uh, is uh, United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, uh, actually the core legal body in the United Nations system for commercial law. And uh, the idea behind is uh, that uh, by harmonizing uh, international uh, trade laws, uh, one will reduce transaction costs uh, related to legal um, lack of predictability or poor predictability. Uh, actually, uh, more recently, and also in the field of um, what we call electronic commerce, but it's really electronic transactions and trust services, uh, we did not uh, so much uh, uh, harmonize the existing ones, but we produced the laws uh, that were actually paving the way. They were uh, addressing emerging business needs in a uniform manner, so we would ensure harmonization uh, from the outset. This is done uh, by preparing treaties and model laws. Uh, Ancitral was actually established in 1966, so now we, we are going. Soon it will be 60. Um, I hope no one will say it's time to retire, however, uh, except 
and uh, uh, Ancetral was already working on uh, electronic commerce uh, in the 1980s. Uh, the use of electronic means in particular in the beginning uh, uh, with regard to payments, because payments are nowadays inherently electronic, uh, both uh, for uh, uh, large sums and for small sums. And then also uh, on something called the uh, electronic data interchange or EDI, which was uh, already a form of automated uh, uh, exchange uh, of uh, information in the commercial sector. What is really important is that Anstral Tax uh, on, on e-commerce, as they're, they're called, but really on digital trade, have been in, enacted all over the world in more than 100 states. And as I said, many, many of them are uh, members of the Commonwealth, and I would say in, in particular, the, the, the pioneer and the champion of these texts uh, is uh, Singapore. Um, and uh, all of these texts are available, of course, in the Ancestral website, you know, in the six official languages of the United Nations. So these texts are the Model on Electronic Commerce, the Model on Electronic Signatures, the Electronic Communications Convention, the model law on electronic transfer records and the model law on the use and cross-border recognition of identity management and trust services. It is of course impossible for me to talk about all of these model laws. So I will focus on the two most recent ones, the model law on electronic transfer records and the one on identity management and trust services. The model law on electronic transfer records, and I have to say, I was the secretary of the working group for the adoption of both model laws. So. I was directly involved uh, in preparing these texts. The model on electronic transfer records, uh, as we call Melita, we in, in an affectionate manner, has attracted uh, really significant attention lately. Um, it is indeed an enabler of uh, of digital trade financing and also of paperless trade facilitation. Uh, so it has really these uh, two streams. One has to do with the uh, uh, access to finance, and the other one has to do with the uh, transport. And it, it is also a text adopted in uh, 2017, already taking into account uh, these uh, emerging technologies like blockchain, like smart contracts, like uh, internet of things, and so on and so forth. So what is the core issue of Melita? Uh, there are commercial documents and instruments uh, that uh, incorporate on paper the right to performance. The performance is the delivery of goods or the payment of sums of money. So you have a list uh, here, uh, bills of lading, definitely, we are all familiar with them, uh, promissory notes as well, checks, those who are using checks, uh, uh, you know, uh, they are of course familiar with them. Some, some uh, economies, uh, some countries, checks are quite popular, like for instance, in the US. Um, and so on and so forth. Now here, the real issue is the incorporation of the right to performance in the paper. And because who has the paper can ask the money or can ask the goods, that right is transferred with the paper. Uh, it can be transferred with the paper and with a signature on the back of of the document on the back of the paper, or it can be transferred to bearer simply with the with the paper itself. Uh, but the issue here is that paper is tangible. That is to say, we can touch it. We can put it in a pocket, put it in a wallet. It does exist in the real world. And uh, and of course, uh, in the electronic environment, uh, we cannot touch it. But since we can touch it, we have notions like possession and delivery that have to do with the physical interaction, which we don't have online. So uh, Melita uh, is a model law that is enabling, that is to say it doesn't affect regulations, but it does not introduce any regulation, which is technology neutral. We have already discussed this, uh, uh, how it promotes interoperability and data flows. It is built around functional equivalence rules. Now, I cannot get into the details of this, but I want to stress that the same law applies, for instance, to electronic bills of lading and to paper-based bills of lading. This is incredibly convenient because 
lawyers and commercial operators do not need to learn two different sets of laws. And they also don't need to change when the medium changes because it is possible. Usually something is issued electronically and then for whatever reason, it, it is uh, converted to paper. But um, uh, all of these stays and what is really important for uh, trade financing is that the rules on the use of these documents as collateral. Typically, I get financing uh, against a bill of lading. I issue a promissory note. These, these are all critical to, to, for access to credit. All the well settled law in this field is not changed because of the electronic form of the document. Requirements for an ETR, I, I will go a bit faster here, mindful of time. Uh, the ETR has to contain all the information that is uh, required for the paper document because the substantive law is the same. Of course, the electronic transfer record can go beyond and can contain dynamic information, smart contracts, uh, uh, information originating from oracles, uh, metadata, all of these things that we have nowadays uh, open up huge opportunities and they are not available, of course, on paper. Uh, in order to be functionally equivalent, uh, there is the need to use a reliable method to identify uh, the electronic transfer record. And the means that specific electronic transfer record. Make it subject to control and retain its integrity. Retain its integrity means uh, that it is necessary to have a record of everything that happens to the record. That's a pun, sorry, but it's really to, 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 to keep a record of what happens to, to this electronic transfer record. Uh, these uh, um, notions uh, of ID, these, these three requirements, uh, which we refer to as a singularity and control, prevent the issue of double spending. Double spending means the possibility of having in circulation two records that refer to the same performance, just like if we duplicate illegally a check, and then we would have two persons going to bank and asking for the same money. Now, as I said before, one real issue is possession. Uh, possession uh, uh, finds its online equivalent in control, uh, because control uh, reproduces online the same features of possession in the physical world. Possession is the ability to control uh, a thing and exclude others. And so uh, through control, I can control the electronic transfer records and especially I can exclude others uh, from interfering with it. All of these uh, uh, will be implemented with technical service uh, at this uh, high level and mindful of time. I just want to say that for instance, uh, many uh, have suggested to fulfill the integrity requirement uh, with the use of blockchain, because the blockchain has this uh, relative immutability and everything is recorded on the blockchain. And since here we want to record everything that happens to our ETR, uh, then blockchain could be a good solution. Now on this one, I would like to add, we should not, uh, however, be misled. The fact that we can record everything does not mean that uh, we cannot record also information to the contrary. So, uh, for instance, I can transfer a check to you, Vashti, but you, Vashti, can transfer this check back to me. And the fact that we have transferred it between uh, uh, the two of us will be recorded, but in the end, I will be again the holder of the check. So, as I said uh, before, uh, all of this is meant also to prevent double spending. And here I would just like to say we were discussing yesterday and today in the community the latest uh, uh, fraud uh, on uh, trade financing. Uh, if I recall correctly, we are talking about $560 million uh, of nickel that disappeared from a, a large trader. And so someone uh, is taking this loss. Uh, now one can imagine these numbers. And this is not um, the largest fraud. It's just what, ha what was disclosed in the last few days. We have many of these. So uh, transition to the digital environment is really uh, imperative 
to avoid uh, these issues. Of course, uh, in order to have security, we need to implement this properly. Um, it goes without saying. Uh, but uh, access uh, to trusted data and a number of controls in the system will help us to to or fight uh, this issue of fraud in, in documentary credit. Um, as I said before, very many uh, members of the Commonwealth has already enacted the other uh, uh, ancestral tax on electronic transactions. And so it is not a surprise that actually Commonwealth member states are also ahead in enacting uh, this MLTR. Out of seven countries in the world that have uh, adopted it, uh, four are from the Commonwealth, uh, Belize, Kiribati, Papua New Guinea, and Singapore. And there's more in the pipeline, uh, both in the Pacific and, and in the Caribbean. Uh, what is really important, and here, uh, of course, uh, my good friend uh, Chris Southworth uh, will illustrate this, is uh, what is happening in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom, thanks to Chris, has actually endorsed uh, uh, MLTR adoption at the G7 level, and now is working uh, very quickly, I have to say, on passing uh, electronic uh, trade documents bill, uh, which is based on MLTR. Uh, it is based on MLTR, but it takes into account also the specific features of English common law, uh, and therefore it has some adjustments. Um, this is important uh, uh, for two reasons. Uh, of course, uh, other uh, Commonwealth member states may wish to adopt MLTR. They can look also at the model law itself, since they have already adopted the electronic transactions, but they also must be aware that the UK enactment is compatible uh, and, and actually based on MLTR, because uh, tomorrow you will receive uh, uh, in the port an electronic bills of bill of lading issued under English law. And you have to recognize it and you have to know this is in line with your public policy and general principles. So uh, there's two sides to this and, and it's really important to appreciate both sides. Adopting the law, the modern law is very good. And at the same time, uh, recognizing that uh, uh, documents issued under other enactments of the model law are also uh, uh, valid uh, and, and enforceable in the jurisdiction. Now, the other text, and I will be forced to be a bit quicker as I have only 10 minutes left, uh, is the model law on use and cross-border recognition of identity management and trust services adopted uh, um, just uh, six months ago, July 2022, we call... Uh, MLIT, this model law, model law on identity management and trust services. Uh, this uh, uh, was actually uh, started uh, at the request of some EU states because the first uh, example of legislation in this field is the EIDAS regulation uh, from the European Union. EIDAS has two parts, the one on identity management and the one on trust services. In my opinion, the, the identity management part is something that has more to do, uh, if possible, with uh, physical persons. And so often it is something that falls under the uh, Ministry of Interiors or anyways related uh, to civil records and vital statistics. While trust services are really um, services that assure uh, quality of data. So these are really something that has have to do with the digital trade and what we were discussing before. Um, MLIT text, of course, because it was procured by, pro, produced by Ancetral, refers to use in uh, trade and trade-related uh, services. But in reality, this is meant to be used uh, for both commercial and non-commercial activities in light of what I just said, that identity management actually has to do with the uh, civil records and vital statistics. Uh, in itself, it, is no, it uh, does not introduce any requirement to identify, but it uh, actually explains uh, how to do so based on a common set of rules. Identity is a set of attributes that uniquely distinguish a person in a particular context. So here we are talking about physical or legal person. The physical person gets a, uh, one foundational identity at birth. The legal person gets one foundational identity at registration. Um, the main objective of the model law 
with on the identity management part is to ensure the legal recognition of the result of electronic identification. Uh, and uh, in order to understand this, one has to bear in mind that the whole identity management is made of two parts, the identity proofing and the electronic identification. The identity proofing is the so-called onboarding, that is to say, for instance, I get an electronic identity card. That electronic identity card in, in this language uh, means I am receiving attributes that confirm my identity in a context, in many contexts, actually. And the electronic identification has to do with the application of, of that. Now, this may look like very abstract, but in reality, we are already working on this um, in the Caribbean. I hope, I very much hope that it will be possible to have the first uh, enactment of this part of the model law, because there is a, a, a project of the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states regarding uh, identity management and and cross-border recognition of identity management in OECS uh, member states. And so our proposal is to leverage on this, uh, which is something that has already been tested in the 27 European Union member states. Um, there are two ways to um, define the reliability of the methods used uh, for identity management. Uh, one is after the use and the other one is before the use. Uh, this means, for instance, that an electronic identity card can be designated as reliable by the government. But uh, this allows also to use other ways. For instance, uh, I can use a um, credit card to identify myself I, under certain circumstances, and it can very well be that that credit card is sufficient uh, for, the, for the specific purpose. The model law contains also obligations uh, uh, of identity management service providers, but in particular also liability of, of service providers. Um, it is possible, however, to limit liability. I will not get into details now for, for lack of time, I apologize. The second part uh, of the MLIT has to do with trust services. And here, I would just like to, to stress the importance of trust uh, services for the digital economy at large. Trust services are ab about providing assurance of the qualities of data, of a data message. I like very much uh, this definition, the who, what, when, where, and why of data. So who sent the message? What is in the message? Has the message been changed? When did we receive the message? Where was it received? All of these questions, very important. Uh, in reality, when the model has some name, the trust services, the most important and most popular is electronic signatures. Um, I've seen, for instance, uh, recently, there was interest, including the Caribbean for electronic timestamps, and there's a couple of draft laws that make reference to electronic timestamps. Uh, we can have all of these, or we can have also a more general description of trust service because in the model law, in the MLIT, the trust service list is open-ended. Um, the, the mechanism uh, for reliability of the method uh, uh, and the general principles are the same, uh, including for the obligation of the trust service providers and the liability, their li liability. So I will not repeat what I said for identity management. Uh, both for identity management and for trust services, there are rules on cross-border aspects. Uh, but here I have to say that it it will not, I, I believe that it will be implemented uh, in possibly in different ways because for identity management, uh, there is a, a public interest in knowing in advance uh, which credentials are considered reliable. So for instance, in the example that I gave before, uh, the law could say for all uh, OECS member states, uh, electronic identity cards issued by government are considered reliable and equivalent in each country, which means that each citizens of each state can identify herself or himself in another country by using this electronic identity card. Of course, there must be 
uh, compliance with certain technical requirements, minimum technical requirements. But uh, for trust services, in particular for electronic signatures, uh, most of them are not declared reliable uh, before the use. And so there will be more flexibility uh, and, and many non-qualified trust services uh, actually will be used. Um, in itself, uh, this model law can be used also as a template for, for treaties and other agreements. Um, so to conclude, I uh, reiterate the view that it is essential to enable data flows. This is what digital trade is about nowadays. Uh, there can be a flow of goods, there can be a flow of services, but there is also on the side a flow of data. And, and uh, this uh, calls, of course, uh, for uh, appropriate uh, legal environment. And again, uh, my fear, especially in developing countries, is that uh, there is over-regulation. There is desire to protect the citizens, to protect the consumers, uh, maybe also to protect uh, small uh, and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the market is not such uh, that can uh, accept over regulation and so uh, this stifles uh, the offer and and uh, there is a more demand than offer for these uh, digital services um the good news is of course ancestral texts uh, have been very popular and and we thank uh, states for that and uh, we hope that they will continue to be popular especially in developing and least developed countries and especially with the commonwealth member states and uh, I would like to say that also the latest trends like regional trade agreements, digital economy uh, agreements, and also uh, Chris might, might have mentioned the negotiations for the joint statement initiative of the WTO are making reference to these texts, uh, including uh, MLETR. Um, but uh, I would also like to say it is not enough to adopt the law especially in developing countries, it's really important to raise awareness and build the capacity, uh, both of uh, the legal stakeholders and of the private sector at large, so that they would really take advantage of this. And so when one uh, decides to allocate resources for law reform, it's also important to allocate resources for this implementation phase, which is sometimes neglected. Now I have a uh, spoken i believe for more or less uh, 35 minutes i apologize if i had to go a bit uh, quickly in what i said but i hope uh, that it was clear and uh, i don't know if you uh, vashti you want to ask if there is uh, any burning question right now luca i would like to thank you so much it is very hard for an even in-person presenter to have everyone's captivated attention after having a large Caribbean lunch. But you have managed to have us all captivated and spellbound. In this regard, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions because I see that um, there are several burning questions around, around the table and around the room. So on that note, um, I can possibly take a start in terms of um, your presentation, you had mentioned the use of blockchain um, as a possible technology that can be used uh, as part of promoting greater assurance and transparency under Melita. Do you have any idea of which countries, not just across the globe, are considering using this as part of their process? Uh, many, many of the... Uh users of blockchain uh, are uh, actually uh, private uh, sector service providers. And I have to say that uh, they use uh, blockchain in different ways. Uh, so, and basically none of them uses only blockchain. They put uh, selected critical information on the blockchain while uh, probably the, the majority of the information does not go to the blockchain because the blockchain in itself, it's expensive and it has all, not only uh, economic uh, costs, but also environmental costs. Um, there are ex examples, the, the most famous example of public sector use of blockchain is uh, an ecosystem called the Trade Trust that has been deployed and is used in Singapore 
uh, which is a blockchain based uh, and uh, this is uh, an ecosystem means a space where all the service providers can join provided they meet a certain minimal standards. And one of them is to ensure that their services are interoperable so that the data can be exchanged across service providers. Uh, but um, at the same time, this is actually promoted by government, by Singapore's IMDA, which is the agency in charge of promoting uh, information uh, and communications uh, technology use. So uh, they believe in it and they, they, they are uh, continuing to use it also for live transactions and it's under development. I believe uh, that more generally blockchain had a big phase of hype and now is hitting the so-called plateau, you know, of disillusion. And then it will go towards uh, actual use uh, uh, for the things that it, it it is useful for. It's not uh, it's not uh, the solution to all problems, but in certain cases, like what I mentioned before, it can be useful. Um, I I really believe uh, it will be a bit like what happened for PKIs in the 1980s. And some people were saying PKIs will be used uh, uh, all the time. And they are used a lot, but not all the time. Um, I see a few hands around the room. I believe the permanent secretary of the Ministry of the Attorney General has a question for you. Um, from Trinidad. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello? Yes. Good afternoon. Um, no, I just wanted to find out whether or not, I mean, we have a lot of issues with capacity um, in our ministry as well as in Trinidad and Tobago. And I was just wondering whether or not um, they would, they would all offer training um, or capacity building um, in the areas of um, international e-commerce laws and that kind of thing. So, um, so I was just wondering if you all have any kind of set programs or whether or not that would be available to other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ancetral does uh, that kind of work to a limited extent because it is a small organization. It's part of the United Nations Secretariat Office of Legal Affairs. But luckily, we can, uh, we can uh, rest on the shoulders of giants. Uh, of course, uh, the Commonwealth Secretariat is one uh, strong partner to organize these kind of activities. But both the Commonwealth and Ancetral uh, are partners in the E-Trade for All initiative, which is coordinated by UNCTAD. And UNCTAD has a specific uh, training, uh, both online and in person, including on legal aspects. So uh, typically, a request uh, that is sent to us, we we can discuss with UNCTAD or but even better is sent to UNCTAD and is discussed with us. And, and of course, uh, we uh, cooperate in preparing the materials when they deal with the uh, ancestral texts. Uh, right now, there is an online course on uh, identity management, which actually is aimed uh, especially at small islands. And this can also be delivered in person, of course. UNCTAD really has the funds and we can, we can arrange a coordinated action uh, with their help because they have the money, they also have the expertise on the delivery, both remotely and in person. But of course, we come in to make sure that you have some lawyer who would tell you something very boring and very legal that all the lawyers like. So we, we make sure that we participate. I am sure that they will be calling upon you and take up your offer. Um, on that, uh, I have a question from Oiz. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. My name is Mohammed Oiz Khan, and uh, I work at the Commonwealth Secretariat. Maybe my question is not related to the current presentation, uh, but as it is uh, uh, acceptable, accepted that regulatory impact analysis is one of the most important tool for good regulations. So is Oncitral doing anything or regulatory impact analysis, or do you have any templates for that? 
or you're working in some countries providing some kind of technical assistance or something we we don't deal uh, with regulation we deal with the the effects of regulation uh, in sometimes and i here i would like also to reply to a question that we have in the chat which is uh, what I, would I suggest uh, are the main issues that force the market to reject regulation? Ancetral is on the side of private sector, typically, because commercial law applies to business, business transactions. As such, our guiding light is, uh, uh, of course, freedom of contract and party autonomy, which means the parties are free to, to decide the content of their contracts. In the digital trade space, this means that the parties are free as I said before, to choose uh, whatever uh, software or method or application they like to. Um, at the same time, of course, there is regulation to, to some extent or the other. Uh, a lot of the regulation has to do, for instance, with import-export. So uh, we interface uh, with the national single windows. Uh, we do good work, especially in Asia and the Pacific, uh, to create an enabling environment for paperless trade. Uh, but uh, for instance, with re regard to MLETR, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of regulation for financial instruments that would apply, regardless of the fact that these are on paper or, or in electronic form. Um, I must say, the real issues here, and I, I'm giving a you know, I'm going a bit out of, of my comfort zone, but what I hear a lot is of regulation for data privacy and protection. Uh, that uh, creates real problems to private sector. But at the same time, for certain states, uh, we consider this a human right, and so it's more difficult to, to deal with that. And I would like to say also one has to see things in a broader perspective. Um, the states that uh, think that regulation is good, they don't want to enable too much cross-border data flows. And the states that uh, they think regulation is bad, they want to enable cross-border data flows. And why? Because those who want to enable, they have larger data processors. And the other ones have not. So if data gives a strategic advantage, then one can see where this is going. So I believe that the issue of regulation, again, I insist this is not my field, but it is an issue that requires some really deep thinking from the policy side, because it's not just the impact of existing or or possible future regulation, but really it, it has some, some strategic implications. Thank you, Luca. We have a question from Chris Southworth. Hi, Luca. How, how are you doing? Um, I was giving you a good plug earlier on, so I hope lots of people are going to email you after this. Uh, I, know, I know you've got lots of time to answer, answer the emails. Uh, Luca is kind of the main, main person, I have to say. We're very lucky to have him here, uh, supporting the whole kind of global environment around this Melita uh, drive. Just to support what... Um, uh, it wasn't really a question for you, uh, Luca. It's more just to answer some of the questions on regulation and data. I think we've got to be clear here, we're talking about B2B data. It's not, we're not talking about B2C in the transactional space. This is commercial trade information that's already available on paper. All we're talking about is putting that into the digital realm. So there are lots of concerns around data uh, from both companies and governments, but a lot of it is over-egged because we're not talking about any personal data that's not already existing. We're not talking about any different way of transacting. We're just talking about transacting in a digital environment. I think that's a really important point. But in terms of implementing Melita, it's really important to talk to the financial regulators. And if you have them, information regulators. Because the last thing we want is to do a fantastic piece of legislation. And then the regulators say, no, we're not going to accept information in digital form. So getting them warmed up is one area where the government can really, really help because coming from the commercial sector, that's obviously very difficult for lots of different reasons. Uh, it's it's one, uh, one of our asks that I should have put on my list actually in terms of a call to action is to engage those regulators and make sure they're on board. Uh, it shouldn't be controversial what we're asking here. I hope that's helpful. It's very helpful. Uh, do we have any other questions uh, across the room? 
All right. On that note, I'd like to thank you so much, Luca. And I wish you a wonderful evening. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much.